Alright then, let me show you what we're going to be working on here next. Got a piece of pipe here. This actually came from a local golf course, so I assume it has something to do with some of their piping, piping and irrigation. Got some kind of gizmo on a threadlet right there. And a couple flanges. This is definitely a weld on flange and was meant to be welded on. This, this flange looks like it's a thread on flange. Looks like there was a threads right here. And this is probably leaked rusted through and leaked and someone has patched on it so at this point this is probably not worth continuing to patch on if it's rusted that bad and rusted through and they've already patched on it it's time for a new piece of pipe i think we can use the threadlet those fittings are no problem and we'll be able to use the flanges i can show you a little bit about two hole and flanges with this job and and we can talk a little bit about things that are involved with uh, lining up flanges like this and, and different things, reasons why, you know, you got to put flanges on a pipe in a certain way. Now I got a piece of pipe out here and I'm going to be cutting a new piece of pipe for this. So we'll take a look at that. Had this piece of pipe in the bottom of the rack over there and I chained a forklift to it and drug it out. It's a new piece of pipe. It hadn't been used as far as been used to stuff flowing through it, but it does have surface rust because it's been outdoors for a while. Um, this is a four and a half inch schedule 40 pipe. Um, this is what I'm going to cut me a piece of this. You see, I drug it over here. Oilfield hand would never reach down there and, and, and unhook that hook. Oilfield hand would just do like that. So I'm going to get that piece of pipe in here and we'll get it cut. So I got the pipe in here. It's on the rollers on the saw. I am going to cut that with the saw instead of the beveling machine. I'm not worried about the rust on that pipe because it's not that real heavy scale rust. It's just some surface rust. So I don't think that's going to hurt my blade too bad. Going to turn our attention here now to this pipe that we're going to be reworking. And what we want to consider on this, uh, we want to see how these flanges are on there and how they're rotated and if they're square, things like that. Because one of the instructions, the main instruction that I got with this job was the customer said that the thing needed to be welded up the way it was. Well, part of what that means is that the way that this thing was bolted into whatever it's bolted to, it matches up the way this one is. So I have to duplicate this. And there's a couple things that need to be considered on, uh, on a pipe flange job when you're talking about something fitting. And one of the things is if the flanges are square with the pipe. When we're talking about a flange being square with the pipe, you know, we're talking about when the pipe's level is the flange plumb. And you have two places to worry about that. So one of the things we want to look at, like if I just put me a torpedo level on the pipe, I look at that, I get a little bit of left bubble. I'm, that's what I would call left bubble. The bubble is between the lines, but it's favoring the left. So if I come over here and put one, and I see here, I, I'm getting the same thing. I'm getting some left bubble, slight left bubble. So that tells me that the way we're sitting right now, that flange is 90 degrees from that pipe. We're not real crooked right there. So we'd want to we'd want to know how this one is. Uh, there's a nice flat spot right here on this one. Let me put it with the the bubble up. So on this one, we're pretty much plumb. So that means we're not far off. You know, the difference between left bubble and plumb is very slight. So I would say in this position, uh, those flanges are square with that pipe. 
But there's the other the other way that we need to think of it is we need to turn this. Let's turn it about 90 degrees. If we turn this pipe right now, we're about 90 degrees from where we were when we checked it the first time. And what I'm getting now here is a slight right bubble. And if I come over to this flange, I have a slight right bubble. So there, that flange in both directions, all the way around and for all purposes we can consider, that flange is square with that pipe. So let's check this one. There, we're pretty much plumb again when this is just a slight right bubble. So, I, for all purposes of fabrication, I could say that to make this the to make the next one we're doing, the rebuilt unit, uh, fit in the same place as, as this one, as far as the way those flanges line up being square with the pipe, they do need to be square with the pipe. So that's going to be something to consider. Uh, another thing, the next thing we want to consider is how are these flanges turned? Now, what we want to... On new pipe fabrications, what you should always have and what you should always strive for with regards to uh, how your flanges are positioned is what they should be what's called two-hole level. When, when flanges are two hole level, that would mean that you could take two holes like this, those would be level. And when these two holes are level like this, the two holes on any other flange on this pipe should also be level. And if we look at this assembly, the way it's made, it is not two hole. So let's, uh, let's look at two holing for a second. Pipe assemblies are generally two-hole, flanges are two-hole, with a set of two-hole pins. This is a slip type. This is the one I like the best. Some of them have threads, but in either case, the purpose is that you put your two-hole pins in a couple of the holes and make sure they're tight. And then you can put a level on the pin and you would adjust that so that those two holes are level. So this is two hole. We got a we got a set of two hole pins in the flange. We've positioned our our uh, torpedo level on the two hole pins and we've got those two holes level. Now, on this particular flange, if those two holes are level, these two holes are level, these two holes are plumb, these two holes are plumb, it would be two hole level between that, that hole and that hole. Uh, it's just, this, this is squaring this up based on the way it's clocked or the way it's rotated. So, on a new pipe assembly, when you're fabricating pipe, you would put all your flanges on and tack them on, weld them up with them two hold with two hole pins like this. And when that's done, you can put your pipe spools, your 90s, your 45s, your T's and all your parts will fit together and come apart and go back together correctly. If everything is two hold, then everything's going to line up. This is my Flange Wizard center head. Has that level. I'm just set on 90 degrees. You notice I got that threadlet on there and I put my torpedo on it and I rotated this pipe until that was level. Now I put my center head on the flanges and make a punch mark.
So with that threadlet on top of the pipe level at top dead center, I have a punch mark on each flange at top dead center. And I can put my center head right back on that punch mark and return this to that position. So our flanges are square with the pipe. Our pipe length is 52 and 3 eighths. From the end of that pipe to the center of that thread, threadle it, 16 7 eighths of an inch. This distance from the inside of this flange to that threadle it, 4 and 5 sixteenths. But we got everything we need. Let's cut it. Got parts cleaned up. <clears throat> Got a piece of pipe cut. Got my center head setting on the punch mark. We've got it level. So our flange is at the top dead center. Same place it was when we put our punch mark on. I've adjusted this jack right here to make sure that this flange where it's where it's setting right now it's plumb I've adjusted these two jacks right here so that the pipes level looking at the flange I've centered this pipe to where I have the same distance right here and right here and I've centered this pipe to where I have the same distance here and here. And that gap looks a little bit wide to me. I'd like to close that up a little bit. And what you'll see people do when they've got... You know, I've taken the time to get a bunch of things right, right here. And if you see you got those many things right but your gaps too wide but you only want to move this pipe that direction oh I'm gonna say I'd want to move it that way I definitely want some gap in there just not that much I've got almost a quarter of an inch there I'd like to have about an eighth so we're talking about moving this thing one eighth of an inch 
Well, let's... What people would want to do is they're going to want to grab that pipe and do this. They're going to grab that pipe and push it that way. That's not going to work. You know, the, 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 it's not going to work on the jack stance. You know, you're basically just leaning the jack stance. Let me show you a technique on, with pipe on jack stands to move that and not mess up anything that you've spent time in getting right. So in order to close that gap, I've already said, when you've got a piece of pipe on two jack stands, you can't just grab this pipe and move it this way or that way. It just doesn't work. It just makes the jacks lean, and if you get the jacks to lean too far, they just fall over. Uh, if you just push it a little ways and they lean a little ways and then you let go, then the pipe's just going to return to where it was and that's not where you wanted it. So what is it that you need to do? How do we get this pipe to move that way an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch? What you need to do is you have to change the position of this V-head in accordance to this pipe. Now the way you would go about doing that is to tap it. See this, in order for this pipe to go that direction, this V-head needs to be under that pipe that way from where it is now. So I'm going to put my hand on top of this pipe. Just a little bit of pressure. I'm going to look at the gap and then I'm going to tap the V-head. So let's see how we look now. Those three little taps I just made has taken this taking this gap from about a quarter of an inch down to probably 330 seconds. And what I said I wanted was one eighth. So I want a little more gap than this. Next thing I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use a wedge. I'm gonna use a welder's wedge. This is one of the wedges like you uh, buy from a welding supply. Uh, they're really nice. You can also make wedges. But you can see based on the shape of this why it's called a wedge. It's shaped like a wedge. And this spacing wedge, I'm going to slide it right in here. And I'm going to push just slightly till I get that eighth inch that I want. Just like that. So another, an, an, another thing I'll explain why you might want to use a wedge uh, not only did it help me adjust that a little, but when you put a gap in your pipe and you tack it, that hot tack shrinks, it's going to close your gap. Now by having that wedge in there, it's going to prevent that gap from closing so it doesn't get too tight on you. So with our center head holding our flange, uh, punch mark on our flange at top dead center, our gap at an eighth of an inch, our flange is plumb. The pipe is level. This is ready to tack. But you don't just tack it anywhere. Now, keep in mind, if this is plumb and that's level, that's only talking about this way. This, this flange could still be wrong this way. We're, we haven't done that part yet. You'd have to turn it 90 degrees and re-plumb it to work on that part. So right now, with what we've got, that plumb, that level, the places I would want to tack would be the absolute bottom and the absolute top. And that's going to keep this pipe from moving like this. So that this level pipe is mated up with this plumb flange, and then we know that flange is 90 degrees from that pipe. And obviously, with my wedge in place right there, the first place I'm going to tack is going to be the bottom, then I'll pull out the wedge, take a look at my levels. If everything's good, we'll tack the top. I got two tacks on that flange over there that we were talking about. I haven't tacked this one yet, but I, I do have it where it's at top dead center uh, with the center head on the punch mark. Um, got it leaned back against the hammer. You know, whatever works. We're ready to roll on this thing, so... Let's do it.
this thing's all tacked up. I'm ready to weld. And I'll talk about welding this for a minute and uh, just basically talking about welding a piece of pipe that is uh, a piece of pipe or some sort of a vessel that may need to hold a liquid or hold pressure. Um, in the case with this, in the shop, I'm going to put a pass in this with my Millermatic with the solid wire MIG. I'm going to put one pass in it. And what I want to talk about with that is I want to talk about this shield gas because I want you to know when you run a mixed gas on your MIG, a gas that contains argon, this is an argon CO2 blend. And this is commonly used for a solid wire MIG application. And it's the the nicest gas. It's gonna make your make your MIG work nicely, really smooth and really well. But let me let me mention something. When you're operating with a gas that contains argon uh, on your solid wire MIG, that has an effect that can be negative. The negative effect that I'm talking about is when you run solid wire MIG with a gas that contains argon. The reason that you can weld through things like a little bit of paint, a little bit of rust, a little bit of mill scale, stuff like that won't hurt. If you're running a gas that's got some argon in it, you can weld through that. And it won't really affect your bead appearance and, and it'll make a good structural weld. But when you're welding, with your solid wire MIG, with a gas that contains a percentage of argon, it allows that arc to form on top of the puddle. Although that's part of what makes that weld smooth, it allows for spray transfer and it does good things. It also will cause leaks in pipes and pressure vessels. Don't, don't take it as I'm saying you can't weld pressure vessels or pipe with a MIG. You certainly can. You also can make welds that will hold pressure with a solid wire MIG, with a gas that contains argon. You certainly can. But your material needs to be immaculately clean and you would have to grind every one of your starts and stops in order to guarantee that you would never have leaks. The way that pressure vessels and pipes are often welded with solid wire MIG is rather than use a gas that has an argon blend, they'll run pure CO2 gas. Now, if you've ever run pure CO2 with your solid wire MIG and you compare it to a gas that's a mixed gas with argon, you would probably say that it's kind of ratty. It's kind of rough. You know, you see your puddle fluttering and it seems like you can't weld through mill scale and it spits and sputters if you try and weld through paint. The reason that that puddle with that pure CO2 is so ratty, the arc is under the puddle. You're seeing the puddle boil because the arc with pure CO2 is in direct contact with that steel. That's why with pure CO2, it's not going to weld worth a hoot if there's mill scale, if there's paint, if there's things like that. Now, understand what I'm saying is that when you're solid wire MIG welding with a gas that contains an argon, when you weld through this paint or you weld through some rust or you weld through some mill scale, the thing that can happen is in a tiny little place, that, that wire arcing on top of that puddle can make a tiny little place where if pressure, meaning not structural pressure, but pressure like air pressure, fuel pressure, water pressure, uh, it could find a place to leak out of that weld. And where it's generally going to leak is where you started or where you stopped. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're building a tank, if you're welding on a pipe, 
if you're welding up something that's going to need to hold compressed air or a fluid or something like that, you can do it with solid wire MIG with a gas that contains argon, but you should sand everything to where it's absolutely immaculately clean. It would be a good idea if you have a lot of tanks to build and you want to run pure CO2, or if you have a lot of tanks or pressure vessels to MIG weld, I would recommend you run pure CO2. And the pure CO2 is probably going to force you to clean everything because pure CO2 doesn't go through paint very good. It doesn't go through mill scale or rust very good. It'll spit and sputter and gag and choke and you'll give up and have to sand it anyway. So what I'm going to be doing here, I very rarely use a solid wire MIG with CO2 gas. Uh, I don't keep one set up with it. I don't need it enough. And on something like this in the shop, I'll tell you what I'm going to do on this. I'm going to use my solid wire MIG with my argon blend. And I'm going to throw a pass in this thing just to seal it up. Kind of like a root bead, but not really. Just something to for me to lay the smoke to. And then I'm going to take a stick and weld over that. On this rusty stuff and recycling these flanges and reusing this, this threadlet, that for me is the easiest thing to do. And I know that my stick welds, there's no question it's, it's not ever going to be an issue of leaking. And I don't have to clean the material and I don't have to grind my starts and stops and the weld appearance will be acceptable. So that's what we're doing. Let's go.